Hi, I'm Tim Berglund, and I'm going to show you how to create your first Kafka Streams application. Now, before we get started, I want to make it clear that I'm not showing you all the details. We are going to be walking through code, and I will maybe even literally wave my hands at a few points. I want to give you an idea how the API works. I'm not walking you through a listing of the actual demo app. Now, that app is linked here, and I encourage you when we're done to go look at that code and run it because that's gonna be your next step. But here, I'm really just trying to give you an idea of how to set things up, what the key elements of the API are, that is what the important classes are, and how they work together. So I wanna show you the basic shape of the thing to prepare you to look at the actual code. Now, if you've written Kafka producer or consumer code before, a lot of this will look strikingly familiar. If you haven't, that's okay because it's actually pretty simple. We're gonna start by creating a properties object and we're gonna fill it up with just a few parameters to kind of get streams off and running. Let's take a look at what those are. Now I have imported this thing called org Apache Kafka streams, streams config. And if you look at how I'm using that on lines four and five, that really just prevents me from having string literals in my code. Uh, this configuration map, all the keys are strings and they're just the names of configuration parameters. And the values are various things that we need to tell streams so that it can work. So streams config is there to get me out of the business of typing string literals and give me IDE code completion and syntax checking and things like that. Point being, there are two configuration parameters that we want to set, and those are on line four and five, application ID config and bootstrap servers config. Application ID config is somewhat analogous to a group ID if you're making a consumer group, if you know what that is, but really it's just the name of this streaming application. Now I might be deploying a massive system that has 50 different stream processing applications representing 50 different microservices uh, all over the system. Each one of those is gonna have a different name, a different ID. This is kind of like the project name or the, the build artifact name, really the same thing here. Every instance of this application that I deploy that has that same ID is gonna act in Kafka's mind like an instance of the same stream processing application. And Kafka will work to distribute the load among all of those instances that have the same ID. So this is key at runtime, and this is key also to keep you straight in terms of what is the context of the stream processing that's happening here that's all associated with this node. Now, Bootstrap Servers Config is pointing the stream processing application to the Kafka cluster itself. Remember, this code is not running on a broker. This is running outside of the Kafka cluster proper. So this application needs to know where the cluster is. So it's typical to put the names or IP addresses of two or three brokers in this list here. That way, when an instance of this application wakes up, it can go through that list and say, hey, Mr. Broker, are you awake? Okay, good, you are. Tell me everything I need to know about the cluster and about who I am and about what partitions I'm processing and everything the instance needs to know, it can get just by talking to that broker. In production, you never want to have this be just a single broker because then that's a single point of failure. If that machine is down or has gone down permanently and been replaced with something of a different name or address, then this application can never boot. And we get embarrassing episodes of downtime that way. So make sure you've got two, three, something like that servers listed in the Bootstrap Servers config. Now, a word about types. In the previous episode in the series, I'd said that the events that are in a stream are composed of a key and a value, and internally inside Kafka, that's the good old byte array, key and value, Kafka doesn't care, but you care. You care a lot about the types of those things, and so now we need to make some decisions about how the streams API will serialize and deserialize the data types that we're dealing with in our Java application into the bytes that go into Kafka and come back out of Kafka. Now, uh, this being an introduction, I will again literally wave my hands. We're not gonna dive deep into the topic of surdies, but you're gonna see these in the code. So there are a number of things we can do here. There are built-in surdies for Java primitive types, strings, ints, longs, floats, doubles, uh, byte arrays, things like that. You can serialize a byte array to an array of bytes. It's a complex one, but it's common for the value of a message to maybe be a little more complex. You might use JSON to represent the value, or you might use another common utility, the Apache project Avro. Avro will let you represent some compound type that's composed of many fields and serialize that and store it in Kafka. And what you're seeing in the code in these slides uh, is something that uses Avro. We're gonna be dealing with an object called a play event. Uh, our domain is a music streaming service. 
And a play event, which we're going to deal with in a few different places, is an event of some user playing a particular song in the streaming service. Now, clearly that's going to be a compound type. There's probably going to be a song ID and a user ID and like a duration and maybe metadata about the client that the user is using, whatever. Of course, we're not going to look at those details, but that's a good example of a compound type that you might represent in JSON or Avro. And we're doing it the Avro way here. Your mileage may and can vary about how you want to represent types like that. So with a little bit of configuration information set up and our type system squared away, it's time to actually create a kstream. And kstream is going to be one of the key classes that we work with when we're using the Kafka Streams API. Now kstream is an abstraction over a stream. What's a stream? A stream is an unbounded sequence of structured data. Uh, that structured data, sometimes we call them events or facts, or sometimes we'll slip up and call them messages, but whatever, they're these discrete entries in this long running, never ending stream. KStream is a class that creates an abstraction over that thing. Now to create a KStream, first you see we use this helper class called KStream Builder. And that's got a method called stream that lets us look at a Kafka topic. And in this case, that Kafka topic is called play events. So that's just a conventional topic. Somebody's producing messages into it, but we don't wanna think of it as a topic where we're gonna consume messages. We wanna think of it as a stream that we can perform higher level level operations on, and that's what kStream lets us do. So we call the stream method on the builder, and that gives us an instance of kStream. Notice, of course, that it's typed. Its key is a string, its value is a play event. And again, both the key and the value could be any Java type, the value could have JSON in it. In this case, we're using Avro to help us move back and forth from bytes into a Java class. But regardless of how we solve that problem, the typing matters. And as you can see on line three, when we create the stream, we pass in some type hints. We say, hey, please use the string SIRD for the key and the play event SIRD for the value to do that serialize, deserialize, that's SIRD, serialize, deserialize, when we're doing IO on this stream. We're gonna talk in the next episode about K tables, but since we just introduced K stream, now seems like a good time to introduce the concept of a table and how it differs from a stream. If a stream is an unbounded collection of facts, and these facts are just these immutable things, they keep coming at you, they never stop, a table is a collection of evolving facts. If I'm using a music streaming service and I stream a song, let's say I play Back in Black and I do it at a certain time from a certain client. Well, that fact is immutable. It happened. That goes into the play events stream and everybody else's play events and all of my other play events go into that stream. And each one is really independent of the others. It doesn't matter, say, if I switch to Zeppelin and play Cashmere later on, it doesn't matter that I play Back in Black earlier. Those are independent events. A table, though, is, as we say, a collection of evolving facts. So a table might be an abstraction over a stream of maybe changes to the user profile. Now, if my username is the key on these messages and the value is all of the data in my user profile, then each subsequent event in this collection of evolving facts really overwrites the previous one. It may have been that in my profile, I set a certain location. I said, a month ago, I live in Allentown, Pennsylvania in the United States. And I made that update and that becomes an event in a stream. And maybe later on, I've moved and I say, well, I don't live in Allentown, Pennsylvania anymore. Now I live in Palm Bay, Florida. And I make that update to my profile and there's a new event in that stream. That new event effectively overwrites the previous one. Uh, a table is an abstraction, as I said, over a collection of evolving facts. And the fact of my user profile may evolve as I move around, as I make changes to it, whatever those changes might be. And each new event effectively overwrites the previous one. Maybe for historical purposes, we might be interested in the fact that I moved. But right now, if I want a view of user profiles, I just want to know, hey, where does this guy live? And I only care about the current update, not the previous ones. So that's the basic idea between these two abstractions, kStream and kTable. kTable is a set of evolving facts. kStream is just an unbounded sequence of facts. And if you listen to that exercise I just went through in describing what a k-table is, that really hints at the fact that a table and a stream are really two sides of the same coin. Uh, we could take changes to a table and make those events in a stream. 
then we can take those events in a stream and sort of materialize them as a new view, as a new table, as you can see in this diagram here. And in between, when we've got that, that change log really from that first table, we can do transformations on that. We can do stream processing on that. We have an API for that, fortunately. And we can turn that into a new stream and then later on materialize that new stream as a new K table. And this is a lot of the game as we're writing applications with Kafka Streams. We're doing this kind of thing. Now, sometimes data never properly exists in a table. It's just a stream. It's just an unbounded sequence of events. But as tables come into our life, we have to realize there really is this kind of duality between streams and tables. We can make one into the other. And the Kafka Streams API helps us with that. And in the next episode of the series, we're going to get started looking at how those transformations actually work in code. Thank <music> you.